All right. So we are going to get ready. I think we're good to go here, Alicia. Thanks for setting us up. I want to um, say good afternoon and welcome to day one of the SCORES Poetry Summit, Words in Action. We're so excited to kick off this series of talks with a tribute to Lawrence Ferlinghetti with an amazing group of panelists who knew and worked with him. We're going to hear from them in just a minute. They'll introduce themselves. I did want to just say that um, on behalf of America Scores, my name is Colin Schmidt, the executive director. We are currently working with 15 here in the Bay Area, 70 local school, school site public school partners providing free programming, soccer, poetry, and service lear learning program to young poet athletes around the Bay Area. Nationally, America Scores is in 11 cities. We have over a thousand writing and poetry coaches over 12,000 young poet athletes and tens of thousands of poems written every year by these young poet athletes. We're so honored to have this lineup of uh, incredible speakers. We thank everybody for showing up. Um, we want people to know that this is a live session and it will be interactive, but that these will also become part of an, or an archive and available for, for replays uh, forever, for all we know. They'll live on the internet forever and hopefully be referenced um, far and wide after the live session. Thanks also to our summit sponsors, Soma Equity Partners and the SAC Brand Group. We, uh, uh, again, are so excited to kick this week off and we have over 20 sessions this week. So we encourage people to spread the word, to come back and um, enjoy this uh, smorgasbord of poetry presentations. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our distinguished guests, poets, advocates, educators, activists. Um, and Bobby, I'm gonna start with you. And um, to kick us off, Bobby, you, uh, if you would please introduce yourself and your fellow panelists, and we'll get this rolling. Uh, thank you, Colin. I'm very pleased to be a part of this and to welcome everybody. Um, this is a, you know, a wonderful program. And it's very consistent with uh, the subject of, uh, of the kickoff uh, session, the subject being Lawrence Ferlinghetti. It's in his shadow, uh, in, in his uh, radiance that I introduce myself, Bobby Coleman. I'm the managing editor of Jambu Press, uh, which is a, a fairly longstanding San Francisco-based small literary press and Lawrence had contributed his work as a poet to some of our prior books. Therefore, I was familiar with his dedication to youth poetry and to literacy in society in general. So as we kick off the uh, America Scores effort today, I am very happy to be part of uh, this tribute to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who recently passed on just prior to his 102nd birthday, which was last week. Um, I'll add that um, by way of introduction, Lawrence and I had some similar experiences and similar trainings and that our dedication to poetry and to youth poetry in particular, to emerging poets comes from a very deeply personal place. I can get into that later, but I know you're trying to introduce the entirety of the panel. And I wanted to say how happy I am to be here with Tamsin and Dean, who also are major contributors to, to the uh, local literary scene and also share my dedication to emerging poets. Well, maybe I'll jump in and, and introduce myself. I'm Tamsin Smith, uh, coming to you from Noe Valley, uh, neighborhood in San Francisco. And um, I, I, I would say that one of the things that drew me to San Francisco, I have lived in various places, um, but prior to moving here was living in Washington, DC, was um, Lawrence, not just his poetry, but his role in, in publishing and his strong um, capacity to combine 
um, words of public import with also a lot of personal resonance. And, uh, you know, he and City Lights, I think, has shone for a beacon for a lot of people in drawing them to what is special about this city of poets um, that we live in. And I was fortunate enough to to meet Lawrence um, on a number of occasions and um, get tips from him before my first big reading, which was great. Um, I can share what those tips were if you want. And then just for me, because I'm in addition to being a poet, I'm also a painter. And uh, Lawrence was a marvelous artist. And, uh, you know, I, I look to his paintings as another kind of dialect of his creative force and um, drive to engage with the world in um, a positive but direct and very strong way. So um, he was a, a, an icon of visual arts as well as literary arts in my eyes. So delighted to be part of this discussion. Thank you, Tamsin. And as we um, make the rounds of our, of our panelists, I, I want to uh, steer uh, Dean to the screen, but I want to say about Dean that um, I've seen uh, his participation in things around, around town for a number of years. And uh, although uh, we haven't had many such opportunities to share these uh, events, I know that he is also dedicated to education as well and is a, a longtime faculty member at um, the University of San Francisco's uh, uh, program in uh, creative writing, their MFA program in creative writing. So Dean, would you uh, be so kind as to make yourself seen? Thanks so much, Bobby. Hey, Tamsin. Uh, it's a real honor to be with uh, two legends here uh, on this panel for yet another legend. Um, like you guys, I've been attracted to Lawrence's, not just his work, but his persona, his kind of magnetism. I mean, it's hard to think of an, another figure in poetry that had his um, hands uh, in so many different projects, right? He was always um, a visionary, whether it's as a poet, as a publisher, as an entrepreneur, as an editor. Uh, I really have admired the way in which um, he's got this big brain and a, a big vision for the, for the role of what poetry can do. Um, and as a poet laureate, you know, we've been talking a lot about poet laureates lately. Um, as the first poet laureate of San Francisco, he, you know, did this amazing work of sort of um, making uh, poetry public, like turning the camera outward and sort of bringing poetry to the people, which um, has been a real part of the city for a long time. So it is a real pleasure to be with you guys here to talk about him and his work today. Thanks, Dean. I think one of the things that people often say about Lawrence is how inspiring his work in the community was, not just as a publisher and as a, as a writer, but also just the way that he interacted with people. It came out over the years and especially the avalanche of appreciation upon his passing. Story after story after story of how he would interact with people personally with kindness and with encouragement. Now this is not to take away from his intensity and high standards as an editor and as a publisher. No doubt he aimed high and kept his focus there. But in his interactions with people and in every public opportunity, he stayed kind and present and generous. Story after story of him doing that. So ask yourself, members of the audience, aspiring writers, appreciators, ask yourself how you intend to write and live your life. Ask yourself whether if you were suddenly inundated with fame and attention, would you do as Lawrence did and stay attentive, compassionate, kind, community-minded, and an activist at every point that you could? That's how he did it, because those were his values. It was very clear, very clear from everything he said 
and everything he did. And I think that the future of City Lights as a, as a, a monumental influence on American life and letters, as well as, you know, to us who are interested in, in book publishing, I think that their future is going to be extremely solid because they are tied to those values that Lawrence exemplified. I'm going to read a poem now. And there is a comment here, and I want to address it right away. Comment is from Denise, and it has to do with outsider literature. Here we are talking about this icon and how he expressed his, his personal power and commitments. But I think Denise happened on something that, to say something that's extremely important to highlight. And that is that by being politically conscious in the way that, that he has been, and by promoting outsider literature, by promoting the cause of the less empowered, at all points, Lawrence actually maintained a distance from the establishment. He wasn't part of mainstream publishing. In fact, even though he and I shared studies at one of the uh, East Coast mega, mega universities, <laughs> we both understood the limits of the corporatized culture and of mainstream publishing. So Lawrence actually, not only by establishing a, an independent paperback bookstore, not only by marching with the community for political causes, but also, of course, the famous uh, anti-censorship trials and the championing of, uh, of voices that needed, that needed a champion. So uh, let me read the poem, because I know we're going to go around and celebrate Lawrence by reading poems. It's the primacy and power of poetry that turns us on, not just the fact that he was this tall and had those amazing blue sparkling eyes like I've only seen a few times in my life. Um, so here's a poem by Lawrence called The Cat. The cat licks its paw and lies down in the bookshelf nook. She can lie in a sphinx position without moving for so many hours and then turn her head to me and rise and stretch and turn her back to me and lick her paw again as if no real time had passed. It hadn't. And she is the Sphinx with all the time in the world in the desert of her time. The cat knows where flies die sees ghosts in motes of air and shadows in sunbeams. She hears the music of the spheres and the hum in the wires of houses and the hum of the universe in interstellar spaces, but prefers domestic places and the hum of the heater. <laughs> How's that for keeping it real? I mean, let's, uh, let's do a round talking about Lawrence's um, spirituality and the influence that he had of both the horrors that he saw in Japan, but also of Buddhism and universalism in general, which he studied and was very important to him. It, it permeates his, um, his work and in part was a response to his very, very um, disrupted childhood, very challenging upbringing. Um, that uh, biographically uh, informs, you know, his his arc as an artist. Uh, Dean, would you would you take that on a little bit and talk about how Lawrence viewed the world? It's tough for me to to condense how I think about his vision towards spirituality. As you were talking, I was thinking about that poem, um, "O You Gatherer." Uh, I don't know if you know that poem. Um, it's it's great. Um, I might if I can find it here in a little bit. I'm going to read it. Um, but he invokes almost biblical language to um, 
call people to the act of poetry. So one of the, but not just um, poetry with a capital P, but poetry as in a kind of surrender to that which is bigger than the self, which I think um, of Lawrence as embodying. For someone who accomplished so much and who I think of as being uh, an ambitious driven guy, he did not have a huge ego. Um, he's someone who, um, as you said, I'm so glad someone brought out the notion of outsider literature and sort of staying on the margins. He was someone who never needed um, to be affiliated with a big New York publishing house or uh, teaching at a major university or linked to an MFA program or winning big awards. Um, he just did his work um, the way he wanted to do it. And the, my first encounter with him was this unbelievable a uh, sense of calm and um, deep wisdom. I just remember thinking, here's someone who just knows so much more about the world than I do. Uh, and I, I found that aspect of his personality um, just really rather remarkable. Yeah, that's, uh, that's beautiful, Dean. It, 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 is, uh, it is something of an aura that he had that he must have he must have found ways to access great confidence. I mean, it's true that he became famous early on, but not so early in his life. I mean, when he first arrived in San Francisco, he was Larry Furling, and all wide-eyed, going to Kenneth Rexroth's uh, evening events and meeting people that he thought were a lot wiser than than he. But over time, he became the go-to guy, and yet never got pompous or, or you know, unavailable. I think there was an emotionality to it also. I saw it in the work that he did um, in, the, uh, in the, the groups that he joined that I was in, you know, um, groups of, of uh, poets with with common with common agenda, you know, community community minded poets, and and he would join in a in a way that was one of the one of the gang. There was that sense of 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 not being separate, of being full of love that way, full of actual genuine love for the community and for the common enterprise of uh, literature. And I wouldn't say just poetry because poetry, not the poetry game not the poetry careerist game. Oddly enough for somebody who was so good and so confident at it. And then with that poise, there's that, that breath that you can hear in the rhythms of his poetry. So it's often, he's often mistaken as a beat or a jazz poet, but there's something of the, of the, full, of the full universal breath that he keeps coming to. You know, a lot of references to universal love, and to transcendence. Um, the, the symbol of City Lights, I mean, sure, you know, I could talk about the anthology that, that we're a part of that's coming up as a tribute, but I'd rather focus just on, on, on what Lawrence represents. We do have a tribute anthology. Lawrence authorized it a couple of years before he passed. It was prior, just prior to his 100th uh, birthday celebrations. And um, he knew that it was going to be kind of on his point of political, uh, political focus. And uh, the proceeds go to youth poetry, of course. But he also um, uh, just wanted uh, to breathe a transcendent love into everything he did. So when, so when he joined these groups, even if it was a reading about Haiti, even if it was very, very overtly political, he still came in with this tremendous sense of, of joy. And, and the, the language is always very breathy and relaxed. So I think that the, it's, it's, it's a common error to think of because of the time frame being sort of 50s, 60s, that people then associate it with his younger, 
his younger uh, writers that he published, you know, Kerouac, Ginsburg, uh, even even Lamenti and some of the others that that were published by City Lights, uh, Bob Kaufman, and and they were from the next generation. They and they also represented um, certain edges in society, certain uh, certain imperatives that were not Lawrence's. Lawrence had a a, a a a huge, like a rainbow imperative that was uh, very transcendent, and I think that this came from um, uh, some of his affinities to uh, Eastern philosophies, but also to um, his sense of uh, wonder at the world. I mean, when you are cast adrift as a young man, as he was, I mean, the story is pretty well known that um, his uh, father had a heart attack while his mother was pregnant with him. And then after he was born, his mother was institutionalized for mental instability. And therefore he was raised by relatives and friends of the family so he was born in Yonkers, but then grew up by benefactors who lived near Sarah Lawrence College in Westchester, New York, Bronxville. And then he, um, you know, went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, knew that they had a great literary tradition. And his other studies were at Columbia and at the Sorbonne uh, in Paris always with his uh, pen and his palette and his brushes and uh, aiming high, aiming high. Tamsin, I see you smiling. I want you to uh, hit those high notes that Lawrence was able to hit so beautifully because I know you connect with him there. You know, I was thinking about, um, I'm glad that you you um, lobbed the spirituality question over to Dean, because I was thinking, oh, what, will, what would I say in response to that? Because I think of him so much as, I think for me, his spiritualism was his humanism. It really was all about people and everything he did was lifting up the voices of others, you know, whether it was in midst of the Cold War translating um, important poets from around the world to make sure that um, more people could read and also to give them the spiritual support of knowing that their words meant something even if they couldn't be heard in their own in their own country. And um, uh, so you know that from a publishing standpoint, but I, you know, I also th I was in thinking about this talk, I went back and um, and watched his poet laureate address uh in uh 1998 which is just you know less than a year after i moved here uh and i wasn't there in person but i remember watching it when it first came out and then i watched it again and it's i mean it's such a throwback for those of you who've been in san francisco for a while it's willie brown introduces him and there's that whole but he um he begins with his um baseball elegies which you know is a real uh, it, it is a beautifully balanced poem, but a real call to action against sort of the dominant white culture um, and, you know, sliding though the importance of those other voices in there and really holding true to his view, like Rex Roth, that, you know, poetry was, a, um, you know, a, a tool of urgent communication you know it was a radical tool and it needed to be used and so there he is up on this stage we could have said thank you very much mr mayor i appreciate the accommodation let me read you know poems and answer questions you know after reading two poems he then goes on to rail against the blue angels and the military industrial perplex to um say well you know that whole central freeway thing you know uh let's you know good thing that that got torn down because there really honestly there should be no cars carmageddon is a bad thing we should get all cars out of the city and then he goes on to say how sad he is that the old uh, main library is no longer going to be in going to be in use and you know i guess it was an initiative that you know validated that but maybe we could put another initiative on the, i mean you know, there he is, you know, up there being, um, being a radical and speaking his mind and doing it in his, in his very charming way. But, uh, 
I think it would be, I think it, it is the case a lot of times when people seek, uh, when people um, arrive to a certain degree of acclaim, they don't, they stop speaking their truth because they don't want to topple from that pedestal. And he never wavered. You know, he was given, he was given a voice and he used it to bring voice to others and to talk about things that really matter to him. He loved this city and he was not pleased about the amount of, you know, gentrification, whether it was chain bookstores or other um, stores coming in. And it's pretty interesting to go back and um, listen to that talk now, because these are, you know, still issues that are very much the issues of the day and sort of sadly prescient in terms of, you know, the tra trajectory of the city. But I have to say that he, you know, the outpouring of enthusiasm for people, my kids are in their teens and they know Lawrence more through me talking about him, but you know, it, it has brought a curiosity about reading his poems and reading the poems that he published. And so, you know, I, I, um, I always look for that, you know, bright, bright light, the city lights to think, you know, is that voice still remains, we can still tap into that. And, you know, what he would say to us is, okay, I said my piece, but what are you going to do? You know, I had a call to action, you're the one that needs to pick it up. And so particularly for the, you know, the kids of the America Scores program, you know, it's, it's, soccer, which is using your physical presence, it's poetry, which is using your voice and your intellect. And another core component to the teaching is um, civics and service learning, and how are you going to lead your community. And what I love about the SCORES program is they're really arming kids to be able to step into a space to articulate, but to think beyond themselves, and really be those beacons for, for their peers with whatever, you know, whatever the issues of the future um, will be in the issues that still aren't resolved, but still need, you know, strong, strong people behind them. Thanks, Tamsin. I want to um, continue that some of the points you raised. Um, and I'll hold up Lawrence's picture here. And you can see his face. This is from this is from the manuscript mm. of the book. Yeah, the book is titled Light on the Walls of Life which is a quote from Lawrence about his intentions in his career. And this is Lawrence in his apartment taken by Soel Dai, a, uh, also a, a very, a very talented literary publisher and writer. Uh, Lawrence is in, in his apartment and that photo was taken in 2014. The plate he's holding says, I am you, question mark. I am you. Mm. And so, Denise writes again in the chat that we should try to uh, capture some of the spirit of the beats. But I, as I said earlier, Lawrence said himself he was not a beat. Uh, he published the beats and was in part a fellow traveler. And the spirit of the beats, which was, of course, freedom and automatic writing and uh, countercultural and uh, experimental and uh, yes, jazz oriented. Um, and um, but also um, uh, forward seeking, pushing the envelope, and a movement. Um, but Lawrence was not a beat. Lawrence was a beacon, and that, that was the word you used, Tamsin, a beacon. Now, in what way was he a beacon? And in what way does it relate to America's scores and soccer and and writing and the issues of our time that are that are race and um that are race and and class and 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 coming together and trying to figure out how do we achieve unity with diversity because these diversity issues are so are so uh, uh very you know so so important in in our contemporary uh, situation so lawrence had an interesting situation with respect to race because he didn't really know what he was and what happened was that um, he was raised partly, you know, with the Italian heritage of his father who had passed on. So the Furling became Furling Getty and became a, a huge lover of Italian language, culture, and literature. Very much a part of that and very important to him. But also, 
on his mother's side, he was Sephardic Jewish, but he didn't know that. He didn't know that immediately. It became this sort of half-hidden Sephardic thing. So what happens for people in the Jewish world, it often happens that uh, this happened also with um, Peter Coyote. And it op often happens, uh, Peter Coyote, the actor activist who also know, knew Lawrence. It often happens that people discover that because of the way history gets written and the, uh, uh, the confusion about migration and hidden identities, it often happens that people aren't exactly what they thought they were. And even if they take a DNA test, it sometimes happens that the, the DNA database fields are labeled based on the best information possible. But then it turns out that, that that's actually not exactly right due to the histories of inquisitions and slaveries and migrations and the winners writing the history. So where does that leave us now? It leaves us where it left Lawrence, which was trying to bust it out, trying to figure out what is in the specificity that I love and champion and must stand up for, and what's in the IMU, what's in the unity, what's in the, the transcendent humanism that can actually bring the poetry into something that'll last for a very long time, that'll last, that won't just be, you know, tackling the issue of today, but that's actually going to stand, it'd be worth reading tomorrow. So, one of the things that that he that he took on and dear to his heart was sports specifically baseball so those of us in the neighborhood knew how eager he was to join us whenever we had a softball game and there were north beach um there were north beach um baseball games you know where we would get together and have a picnic and lawrence was very very enthusiastic about joining these so when we were reading at the um, spontaneous memorial outside city lights there were many references to lawrence showing up and participating in the baseball games and of course our um, our stalwart jack hirschman and lawrence were both you know avid baseball fans so that was sort of this common reference they wrote baseball poems uh that were similar you know and that was part of the glue that that kept it together so in terms of america scores and kicking off this festival don't ever forget that lawrence felt that sports and uh and, and team activities were part of the universal glue and uh, he never neglected that um so i think the i think the fact that lawrence had seen um the bombing of nagasaki also um, was important in terms of culture, race, and religion. And I think that, uh, you know, because we all know that story, we know the story that he was uh, rendered a lifelong pacifist because he had seen Nagasaki just, uh, you know, days after the um, destruction of the, of the bombs, um, that that kind of... Um, common human predicament, life and death, um, informed his work. And I think that helps a lot. That helps a lot to understand why that little boy was able to keep things so, so genuine and so universal. Um, I was looking for another photo of Lawrence And here is another photo of Lawrence. Now here is an older fella. And as a younger fella, he had the same face. He didn't have the white beard, but he had that same poise in his eyes. Here's another photo by Sowell Dye. So that's the gentleman we're, we're, we're talking about. And I see there's a, a there's a pattern on the sweater that he's wearing, which does look like an indigenous woman, which is consistent with his championing of women's rights and of Native Americans. So I'm looking for another poem to read. I'm gonna take the liberty. Tamsin, do you think I can take the liberty of reading Neely Tcherkovsky's poem? 
Oh, go for it. Now, the reason I want to read this one is because, first of all, you can't you can't uh, go wrong reading Neely and mentioning his name, which always delights him. Yeah, nothing would make him happier. Yeah, it would make him happy. <laughs> this, is, and this is the one thing. I read I read Neely's work on uh, KPFA, and he was thrilled. So I'm going to take that liberty. The other reason I'm doing it is I just talked about Lawrence's universality and how that can inspire uh, other writers and uh, hopefully our audience. Now, Neely, Neely has been a biographer, one of, one of the biographers of Lawrence, but he also wrote a book called Whitman's Wild Children, which puts um, you know, the American writers that succeeded Walt Whitman into that, into that context where Whitman, who's such a towering figure as a, as a, a transcendentalist, as a, as a, as a universalist, as the, as the, the writer that inspired Howell, which Lawrence uh, Ginsburg's work, which Lawrence published, um, Whitman's wild children does include all the rest of us. And uh, he's such a transcendent figure, such a towering figure in world literature that I think that we shouldn't forget that, that we should never get, stop reading Whitman. We should never stop referencing Whitman. So here's Ferlinghetti at 97 by Neely Cherkovsky, the author of Whitman's Wild Children. Strolling down Columbus Avenue to Little Joe's restaurant, where we'd sit right before the flames, Lawrence in Greek sailor cap, my beret folded in my pocket. This is 1975, and there'll be a heavy rain soon enough. There's Maria taking orders for lamb chops and lasagna. We place our orders. The older cook will soon return home to Italy. He places his cook's palm over one burner high enough not to burn himself, and the flames rise. Lawrence breaks into a smile and turns the decades into a sentiment of words that ring across San Francisco Bay out to the open sea. Ferlinghetti, a woman says, and he answers, no, I'm his twin brother. The real one is at the bookstore down the street, hiding behind a secret door. The lights go on way up on Walt Whitman's cloud where he continues to dispense wisdom and sleights of hand <laughs> while we eat the fire of the years. Uh, while we eat, the fire of the years rises and falls. Later, we walk again and he hands me the keys to his Bixby cabin. No coffee house there, he grins. You have to make hobo coffee over the fire in the open pit. Still, he wanders the streets near Notre Dame and hides out in Mexico and asks, asks Apollinaire to join us for dinner. The French poet shows up 41 years later and takes a seat in what is now a vast Mycenaean dining room where Edgar Allan Poe coaxes a raven from the woods. A Coney Island of the Mind was one of the books I used to hide under my notebook in math class at Arrowwood School, Arrowhead School. Lawrence is 97. The planet is a few decades older. It's 2016, and we need poetry more than ever in the heartless void that has settled on this cold spring morning. Yeah, we offer gratitude, if only for the cabin and the poetry and the library called City Lights, easily as massive as is the Borges Library, the library of <laughs> Babel. Endless lunch, endless fire. And that was Lawrence at 97 by Neely Cherkovsky. Um, he he dug deep. He dug deep to try to capture that that arc from Whitman to Ferlinghetti to Little Joe's restaurant. Bixby Cabin, of course, refers to Lawrence's cabin near the Bixby Bridge in Big Sur, which he was very generous 
to serve with, uh, to share with a number of writers and uh, legend uh, stories have it that even the carpenters who worked on his, on his uh, apartment, uh, uh, you know, the contractors and, uh, you know, people that, that just came, came through his life got offered to stay at the cabin if they were cool, you know. <laughs> Dean, you, do, you have a, do you have a poem for us? Yeah, I do. Um, if it's okay, I think, I, is it okay if I read two poems, one of Lawrence's and one of mine? I was hoping you would do that. <laughs> so um, I, it was one of the great honors uh, to be invited to participate in uh, two of the celebrations for Lawrence's 100th birthday. One was the reading at the San Francisco Public Library where Neely was the the master of ceremonies, so to speak. That was, yeah, I remember that was that. a lot of fun. I remember uh, that, you were awesome. Thank you. Um, it, was, it, was, it was great. Uh, and then also um, I got to read at City Lights um, for the big, it was like a weekend long event, the celebration there for his 100th birthday. Um, and that was really cool too. Anyway, so um, this is one of my favorite uh, Ferlinghetti poems, and it's from Coney Island of the Mind. And it's uh, one of his uh, fairly well-known poems. It's called In Goya's Greatest Scenes We Seem to See. And it's a poem about the great Spanish painter, Francisco Goya, who was one of the first painters to kind of turn away from painting courtly portraits to painting big oil paintings of regular people, peasants, soldiers, and he would often represent them um, in vulnerable situations. He was willing to sort of portray their suffering, their humanity, um, which was um, a kind of counter narrative to the way a lot of the courtly painters were painting the wealthy and the accomplished as sort of regal and godlike. And he was he was really willing to sort of make the subject of his art human suffering. And um, I've always loved that about Goya's work. And um, uh, Lawrence really loved that about his work too. So, and one thing that's so cool about this poem is how it begins talking about these kind of revolutionary paintings by Goya several hundred years ago, but winds up being um, relevant about America now. So this is the poem, In Goya's Greatest Scenes We Seem to See. In Goya's Greatest Scenes We Seem to See the People of the World Exactly at the Moment When They First Attain the Title of Suffering Humanity. They Writhe Upon the Page in a Veritable Rage of Adversity, Heaped Up, Groaning with Babies and Bayonets Under Cement Skies in an Abstract Landscape of Blasted Trees, Bent Statues, Bat Wings, and Beaks, slippery gibbets, cadavers, and carnivorous cocks, and all the final hollering monsters of the imagination of disaster. They are so bloody real. It is as if they really existed. And they do. Only the landscape is changed. They still are ranged along the roads, plagued by legionnaires, false windmills, and demented roosters. They are the same people, only further from home on freeways 50 lanes wide on a concrete continent spaced with bland billboards illustrating imbecile illusions of happiness. The scene shows fewer tumbrils, but more strung out citizens in painted cars and they have strange license plates and engines that devour America. That's a cool poem. Yeah. I love that little turn, a little pivot. Um, they are the same people only further from home, right? That, that, little, that little twist that sort of takes you from the past to the present and reminds you that they are basically one and the same. And so this is my, I feel like what Goya was to Ferlinghetti, Ferlinghetti is to me. So this is my poem titled, In Ferlinghetti's Greatest Scenes We Seem to See. In Ferlinghetti's greatest scenes, we seem to see the people of the world in motion, 
naturally and even quietly, like a bird in a sky made entirely of sky and specifically for birds. Everything its own manner of soaring. They lift off the page in a rage of adversity, as though being written is some sort of resurrection into a world that is real and yet also abstract, from the Latin to draw away. And yet we are drawn toward, if not into, a voice not ours, but that belongs entirely to us, as though we, like language, actually exist. In 150 AD, Kai Lun, a eunuch in the court of the Han Dynasty, invented paper out of tree bark, hemp, rags, and fishing net. At almost the same moment, Marcion of Sinope proposed to the Bishop of Rome the New Testament. 1400 years later, in a print shop in Venice, John and Wendelin of Speer were the first humans to use Roman type. On this day, in this city, I am thinking of the dead. And by that, I mean the living. And in particular, you. Scanning the shelves in the shop that is this life. You carry somewhere inside you a font designed only for your name. It is used in the book, not about, but of you. Imprinted in this very act of living so that we may all read your work, for in each scene, in each face, there is poetry. In the dirt under your nails, on the skin of your children, in the holy music of your daily duties, poetry. Along the boulevards, on the billboards, in the bedrooms, poetry. In your voice, poetry. In your mouth, poetry. In your hands, the poetry that just might save America. Magnificent, Dean. I think you. Thanks. I think you really, uh, you really got the uh, the spirit of this book, right? What is poetry? Yeah. Right? Um, I mean, everyone knows um, a Coney Island of the mind. That's one of the best selling. I think the best selling book, or one of the best selling books of poetry. It um, was. Uh, it, it still amazes people. It, it popped up in my family home because my older sister brought it back from college and it blew my mind is the first book of uh, contemporary poetry that 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 had that that ring of what was happening you know that's one of the books that i think many of us remember how old we were the bookstore we bought it and when we actually got it i remember getting that book in this used bookstore um yeah, I think it changed a lot of people. Yeah, and the book I held up, I, I, um, I think, um, you know, if people want to get a, a brief, a, an executive summary on why poetry is important, um, Lawrence had collected a number of things he had written about poetry and then made that book, What is Poetry? And uh, um I wanted to uh, highlight something, if I can find my glasses, there they are. So when Lawrence turned 100, he was, um, you know, suffering in his eyesight. He was not, uh, yeah, but thank you, Tamsin, you're next. Uh, they, he was uh, not able to come to City Lights for the um, events that happened at the bookstore. And so, um, a choir of singers was organized by his friends and uh, initiated by Agnetta Falk, painter and poet. And um, this choir uh, uh, included me and members of Conspiracy of Beards. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an artsy choir of male singers. We went under his window and then like town criers, we called out to his window and we said, poetry is all things born with wings that sing. <laughs> poetry is the shadow cast by our streetlight imaginations. <laughs> it is the voice within the voice 
of the turtle. <laughs> Each poem a momentary madness and the unreal is realist. I mean, stuff like that. And then we sang, take me out to the ball game. Lawrence comes to the window and waves his scarf in, in delight, you know. That was his last public appearance. He wasn't able to come and hear what happened as the community turned out to express their love for him. And uh, so many readers and, uh, and, and, and singers and people celebrating in the streets and in the store. But Elaine Katzenberg, who's the um, you know, editor-in-chief over at City Lights Publishers, made the point that Lawrence learned early on how to protect his own um, shyness, that basically he was essentially a shy person and a private person and a humble person, but that his kind face to everybody was his way of managing the attention. And as I said earlier, I thought that was um, um, a beautiful choice on his part. So um, the um, the crowd has clamored for Tamsin to read. Well, I can I make a first a plug for the crowd themselves? If there's anyone out there that has a, a question or a comment, I just don't want us only to um, chime in. If not, I'm happy to read. Going once. I want to rec I want to recommend uh, <laughs> In response, in response to a question um, from uh, Colin, the um, we had we had speculated on uh, plugging in a video of of uh, Lawrence reading, but they're they're out there. They're on YouTube. Um, Tamsin, you referenced the um, uh, poet laureate poet laureate address. There's also video of him. I think Colin's asking about the um, the serenade, which I know I. There was some social media posts that went out. I don't know if any of them are posted, but they might be from that birthday. I, 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 I want to recommend to people that there's a poem that he read in response to Robert F. Kennedy's funeral called Assassination Raga. And it was uh, recited at um, Norse Auditorium uh, with Ginsburg present and, and other literary figures. And it is remarkable uh, and that, that, that it's uh, available online. So I, I, I highly recommend that to people because it's a, it's a very historic, um, very historic video. Um, so again, if you Google, uh, if you, I'm sorry, search on YouTube for um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti reading Assassination Raga, it might actually be on Vimeo, but it's out there and it's, it's astounding. Tamsin, so, are you ready? Okay, four minutes. Should I? I have a kind of a short one of Lawrence's, and then a relatively short one of mine. This um, goes beautifully with with uh, everything we've discussed, and I think particularly with with Dean's reading, because I think you know that he was so even in the very intimate, humane work. There's there's a there's a politics in there. There's a message in there, and this is a, a beautiful poem called "A North Beach Scene." Away above a harbor full of cockless houses, among the Charlie Noble chimney pots of a rooftop, of rooftop rigged with clotheslines, a woman pastes up sails upon the wind, hanging out her morning sheets with wooden pins. Oh, lovely mammal, her nearly naked breasts throw taut shadows as she stretches up to hang at last the last of her so white washed sins, but it is wetly amorous and winds itself about her, clinging to her skin. So caught with arms upraised, she tosses back her head in voiceless laughter and in choiceless gesture then shakes out golden hair while in the reachless seascape spaces between the blown white shrouds stand out the bright steamers to kingdom come. And then it was almost literally a year ago, a year ago last week that I um, worked on a poem for just a private little poetry gathering that Bobby was a part of um, to commemorate um, Lawrence's 101st. And it was very early days of 
uh, the novel coronavirus. It didn't even have its proper numerical designation at that point. Um, and so this is, this is the poem I wrote for that night. That go between that prism for Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Blessed are beatitudes on the downbeat. Blessed are thee who BYOB. Blessed are those who attend to attend to landscapes of the living and the dying. Much has been recorded. Of the still life, I must return and learn anew. As with any self-sprung tune, as with each fresh fact retold, one must hear it precisely again, over and over, several times before it can be known and repeated amid the din of dire but aloof admonitions. The world's been crying out, do you enjoy your own mind? Who are we now, alone together in another bygone world? I want the word novel back. I want each of you back, racing down these hills towards what is not lost. Blessed be the new routine, stealing the cold face. I am not waiting. You are not waiting. The sea, the sea up from the ash bed. Sweet mother sometimes dream crimson like fire. That's so beautiful, Tamsin. I, um, uh, do we have a, a, do we have a few minutes left? How much time do we have left? Do we have time for Colin? Do we have time for one of my poems? All right. Sure do. Well, I just want to acknowledge that, that as we've spent the uh, hour paying tribute to our friend, um, that in a way it's a tribute to all of us as well. I mean, Lawrence was both a leader, but also part of our community. And his resonance with us is part of the same spirit as we move forward. Uh, the way that we came to City Lights, the way that we are inspired by, by wh what he did, uh, by what we conjure up as we go to the poetry room or read books that that are published by City Lights, or the fact that that institution exists, or the fact that it started as a, as a publicly accessible paperback bookstore where literature could be purchased at, at low cost, or even just the beauty of Lawrence's vision, the, the connection with the sea, the connection with the body politic, um, the great uh, love of life that he often expressed. So let's uh, let's remember that as we uh, go forward through the through the, the the festival, and also through our own lives and and writing. I think that Lawrence still will resonate for many many generations. That um, that he approached his life in literature in that kind of expansive way. Tamsin, when you called him humanistic, I think that captured this type of spirituality that I was uh, impressed by. So um, he was our friend, but he was everybody's friend. He was a public figure. And uh, I wrote this, this poem. And again, I'm, I'm very happy that the tribute anthology to Lawrence is uh, about to be published. It was days away from going to the printer when he passed on. So we retooled a little bit. And again, it's about to go to the printer. Um, I had seen Lawrence's paintings, and we didn't talk about that much, but Lawrence's paintings uh, were one of his great passions. And he had a, a particular uh, interplay between, well, Tamsin, you're a painter too. He had an interplay between dark and light. And it was the light that he was aiming at. He often said that he was trying to capture light on the walls of life. And it's a reference to Edward Hopper saying he was trying to capture light on the walls. So how do you capture light? You capture the light out of the darkness, out of the fullness of the spectrum. And so some of his paintings actually appear pretty dark. But then there's that blue and that yellow 
and that love that comes and emerges from these images. So when I saw things like his flowers and his other paintings, I wrote this poem. It, it actually um, came from a, um, a display of a poem of his that was at an exhibition of his art. So at an exhibition of his art around the corner, they had a framed poem of his called Allen, meaning Allen Ginsberg on my bed. And my riff is on that poem. Lawrence at my desk. Lawrence is with me here at my desk, an art bomb more powerful than Nagasaki. And when I see his face, I know the truth of the experience and the love that prompts the peace, the terrible sadness of injustice. And the reason he comes here to show his big, sweet, yellow of life, passionate, not just innocence, but a powerful vene vidi vivace, rare yet universal, fluxating from Sephardic heavens clear across his olive oil paradise, a stateless yet ever stately blue radiance glowing across seascape eyes. His open door, abandoning all despair, and his palette and canvas, the writer and the image have the same urgency, a wide open romance with humanity. And from the gone and eternal, and from a book of signs, art bursts in infinite color stretching rays of personal and collective joy upward to the light. So Dean, I saw you smiling at, at some of those uh, early lines and, and I really am pleased because I've heard you read and been pleased by your poetry so often in the audience without you knowing it. So it's good to read for you uh, my friend, and uh, thank you for that response. You too, Tamsin and Colin. <laughs> yeah, well, we are all smiling, um, Bobby, and uh, really appreciate you being here and sharing your poetry and your thoughts and your insight that, that you have that, that uh, many of us are just really still uh, learning about. And, um, and you've, you know, you, you've taken the lid off the jar a little bit for us to, to explore further. Um, Colin? I just want to add that I love soccer. I actually played soccer and I still love soccer and I follow it and I'm a sort of a, a you know, um, obsessed. So sorry uh, to have to reveal that. It wasn't baseball for me. It was always soccer. <laughs> yes. All right, Bobby. Well, someday soon we're going to be in North Beach with, with a coffee talking, talking poetry and soccer. And I think I uh, really can say from all of us and who all, everybody who will watch this, um, later that, um, uh, you know, the legacy that you're carrying forward, um, really, really, there is something powerful in there. It's magical. And, um, and again, we appreciate you being here and sharing that with us. Um, and we uh, looking forward to the anthology. Can that, that can't come out fast enough. So we're looking forward to that and um, happy to spread the word when that's available. Um, let me also just mention, uh, you know, um, Dean and Tamsin have been uh, with us kind of behind the scenes on the festival. Um, they helped, um, you know, bring you, Bobby, into this. And we're so grateful for, for Dean and Tamsin and their work um, on this session and, and all the sessions. And the theme, you know, the, no, it won't surprise anybody here, but the themes of poetry and, um, and social justice is really, is, is really the legacy that I think, um, you know, we're, we're tapped into that we believe in and that those are the voices that will be heard. Um, you know, through events like this, like this poetry festival. So Dean and Tamsin, again, we thank you for, you know, being involved and helping us connect the dots and helping, you know, voices be heard the same, you know, the voices that need to be heard in today's, in today's world. 
Um, to bring this full circle, I, I meant to read this very short poem at the beginning, but this is a poem I wanted to read from a, a fifth grader um, named Vita, V-I-T-A, who uh, attends school just up the hill from North Beach, up, um, up on the border of Knob Hill and the Tenderloin. So she goes to Reading Elementary School and she writes, today my name is Leader. I feel like a sunflower blooming in the savanna. I pretend to act like things are fine. My name was Tomboy. I saw lights flashing before my eyes. Vida means life. Tomorrow, my name will be Batgirl. I will find homes for everyone. I took one step at a time by Vida. Wow. That's great. Wow. Talk about fluidity of identity. Put those masks on, take them off, put them on again. Excellent. That's great. <laughs> Good. Anyways, uh, yeah, well, if there's any final words, this would be the time. Um, we hope to see people again later, later today. We've got St. Mary's, uh, the, the great program, uh, poetry program over there, talking about uh, poetry and literature in a time of crisis. Um, and many, many more sessions. So invite people back for that. But but let me just uh, offer up um, Dean, Tamsin, Bobby, any any final parting words as we move on through the day? Yeah, I just, I, I was just, uh, you know, to reiterate, I think Lawrence kept, kept the subject of love very close to his heart, you know? And I think that his poetry was um, pushing that love out as high and as far as he could go, keeping it real, you know, certainly not accepting the unacceptable. The political agenda was very clear, but always from a heart of love and massive inclusion. You know, he would not, he seemed viscerally uncomfortable with anybody being left outside the circle. Tamsin? Oh, I just add that, um, you know, there's, been a real effort undertaken on, on the part of uh, the team here, Colin, Alicia, and, and Angela, to um, raise up those voices and be as inclusive as possible. And there's a fantastic lineup. I mean, five days of, of poetry and social action. How, what, where do you get that? So I hope you all can dip into other, um, other sessions, and um, I'll see you there. I want to thank you, Dean, as well. Um, this was uh, wonderful. And uh, I certainly had a lot to say, and I was happy to be able to say it. It was a great privilege to participate. Awesome. Thanks, great. Bobby. You were so good. Thanks for all that you do uh, as a writer and an editor. Uh, a lot of us are really, really grateful for your efforts. I thought this was a really apt way to begin um, this Poetry Summit, because as Tamsin just said, uh, the structure of the summit is to sort of bring poetry to as many people as possible and to make poetry's net as big and as inclusive as possible, which is how I would describe how Lawrence thought of poetry too, right? I mean, it was really this net to sort of bring everyone in to poetry's fold. And I feel like this summit is, um, its aims are quite similar. So this is a really <laughs> appropriate way to begin. You know, Dean, when I think about it, where, where Lawrence ended up was, you know, massively popular and influential, but where he started yeah. was definitely do it yourself. That's right. So definitely independent publishing. And uh, I mean, what, what all three of us do, frankly, is, is what Lawrence started doing. And uh, I doubt very much that he knew how far it would go. I mean, he had a lot of confidence and he certainly was aiming at it, but I doubt very much that he knew it would work. <laughs> you know, uh, things, right. I mean, things certainly uh, did fall into place. And uh, well, you do you do things because they're worth trying, not because you know they're going to be successful. So exactly. Yeah. So for anyone who I don't know if the recording's still going, but for anyone who has a, a brilliant idea, you got to go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Um, and again, uh, 
you know, we could have spent a whole week on this on this subject with you three um, and the stories and what you know. So um, thank you for sharing this and really piquing our interest to, to learn more. And we hope to see you soon on the summit and in real life. Stay safe. And thank you again. You're here. Thanks all.